It is such a joy, really an honor to be here. Uh, I would say the presence of God in the Rock of Roseville is not diminished. I mean, God is when you, with you of a truth. Uh, Pebble Beach is still flourishing down there, and uh, people are still worshiping God in a powerful way. And that's a big deal. I mean, it, the planet has gone, have you noticed the planet's gone through a few seasons? Have you noticed that at all, the little changes going on, microscopic? But uh, it, it is a, a challenging time for people to grab a hold of victory and uh, like a pit bull and not let go. And so for the ferocious ones that were in the front, uh, that were gripped tightly upon the presence of God, thank you for that. Uh, may it always happen, honestly. Uh, we can over time drift and wind up in the back row drooling, but it's nice to be in, in the very, very front passionate with purpose and conviction. And guys, it's a glimpse into eternity. You know, that this is a little bit, uh, every time we taste of the presence of God, we're going, uh, eternity is in my heart. And um, I can't wait, but I'm enjoying eternity right now. We are living everlasting life. You know, as a young Christian, um, I would use the term uh, a lot when people ask, how are you doing? Well, I'm in kind of a transition right now. And I'm in a transition. And I found myself saying that literally every day. <laughs> and after a number of months, and in those days, time was measured in months. So months was actually years, years were decades. And so in a short amount of time, I realized the redundancy of saying I'm in transition. Because in, in reality, every day is a fluid moment. Every month, every year, every season are fluid. And so transitions, handoffs, being ready for the next, being ready for change is really what life is about. Um, if you've not changed recently, um, then you need to really say, why does God change every day? Why does he have a jump start, brand new, new memories, new moments? You, ultimately, it's because he's trying to say, hey guys, yesterday was awesome, or it was really hard, whatever, it's over. We're going on to the next day. We're going on to the next season. And so when I think about transitions, I think about the verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18, from glory to glory. Glory, the Bible says, always results in praise and honor. So from glory to glory. Now, glory comes from obedience. As you obey the Lord and you transition from one stage of your life, one dimension to another, it's glory. And it always is surrounded by praise and honor. It's always God saying, good job. Good job. You were able to finish that segment and go on to the next. And that is something we should get used to. We need to get used to the fluidity of God going, don't get enamored by this. Don't make an idol out of the moment or an idol out of a situation, but embrace it as something brand new. And, and even though we have found at this point, and candidly, um, I've been a Christian, as was said, 50 years uh, ordained an evangelist 50 years ago this November, so really been in ministry for 50 years. And um, I've never seen a more perplexing series of events in our planet overall that are affecting the church, in particular in America, but I assume around the world. This is a very fluid time of people having to respond to unprecedented change. You know, sometimes it's a one point four, two, five. You know, other times it's a 2.0. It's a 3.0. I mean, it's another, it's a paradigm shift where everything kind of goes back to zero. And all of a sudden you're having to go, uh, whatever thought I was having that normalcy as we know it was going to continue, I need to, you know, barbecue that little puppy because that's not happening. The reality is the planet has changed and we must too. And I understand it's a normal reaction to have a measure of trepidation, to feel uncomfortable about it, because we're, it really requires at that point uh, faith, trust, believing that the brains of the operation knows what's going on. Yeah. You know, there is a throne that is fit for one person, and it's not your rear end. <laughs> so he's in charge, and if he's in charge, things are going awesome. Your level, and it was said beautifully, and again, I loved the worship. I, I loved everything that was going on today. I loved what Aaron shared. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But he was talking about the fact that we don't need to know 
what's happening in the future. We just have to have complete confidence in the one who knows the future. I don't have to know. I mean, I've never banged on a cockpit door and said, what's going on in there? <laughs> I'm trusting a total stranger who's flying me at 30,000 feet at 600 miles an hour that he knows what he's doing. Well, has, if you don't think God has done enough for you, would you stand right now? We just want to, it just, you're like a, a dodo. We've never seen a dodo bird before. The reality is all of us, we are the most, this is a gathering of some of the most spoiled people who have ever lived on the planet. People who have, all, the only problem is they have spiritual amnesia, that they forget, I don't remember that. But you have been blessed beyond measure. Do we need to go through the videos? Do we need to get a red box in heaven and just start checking them out? Do a Netflix you know, summary of the amazing moments of your life. Seriously. That's why you establish something like communion, that you remember, you're gonna forget. Remember, remember who I am, and then you'll remember who you are. Remember who I am, and you'll remember your future. You'll be excited about every day. What happens today is the least significant thing happening. Who cares? I'm not, I'm not concerned about what's happening today. I'm concerned about how I respond. All my armies are set on that battlefield. Because I, I know that God has done enough. I love the movie. There's a movie, Salt, Angelina Jolie, in the final scene, she's on a helicopter, and there's a cop that um, thinks he arrested her because she was incapable of defending herself. But she actually could have shot him right then, but she wanted to be arrested at that point. And so the guy is kind of waxing eloquent about how he, you know, I could have, and she looks at him and she goes, you know better. And I'm going, Ooh. I feel like the Holy Spirit, every time I, I am wavering, I'm thinking, you know better. I, I do, I do. You, you got me. I know better. I do know better. We all know better. That God has good things ahead of us and we can believe for that. Now, if you take metaphorically that a day of the Lord is a thousand years, so that means uh, an hour would be 41.6 years. We're speaking metaphorically. That means five minutes would be three and a half years. And someone really famous was incredibly powerful in three and a half years. Yeah, I'm not gonna mention his name, but you can look it up. Someone really powerful in his five minutes of interplanetary time did extraordinary things. And so I've always liked to think of five minutes. What can happen in five minutes? Well, I'm gonna start by sharing a story that I think is probably one of the most incredible five minutes in the history of the world. And it happened in January of 2009, January 15th, exactly. A plane took off from LaGuardia Airport in New York. And within 100 seconds, Canadian geese flew into the engines and rendered them powerless. He had no more power, no more thrust, over. 100 seconds. You think, I mean, in the 98th second, you're thinking, you know, no problem, you know, bring out, take up the, uh, the wheels. And then all of a sudden, in 100 seconds, you're experiencing something that in 99% of the time means you're ixne on the ought day. You are done. And so Captain Sully Sullenberger had to make some very fast decisions. Cool, calm, collected, it's recorded. And within three and a half minutes, he landed the plane. And here's a picture on the Hudson River. That's his little congregation <laughs> in Pebble Beach. I would guarantee you some of those people prayed some hot prayers right there. Those are, those are some prayer warriors. <laughs> and I, I know the fact is in when a plane is on fire and people are dying inside, they can't get out, that people are either yelling to Jesus or cursing God. That's just the way it gets down to that kind of a crossroads. And yet these people survived it and were waiting to be rescued shortly. And I think about what he said, and this is uh, his comments later on. Sully said the moments before the ditching were the worst, sickening, 
pit of your stomach, falling from the floor feeling that he'd ever experienced. Very apt description. But then he said he, he suffered from PS, PTSD afterward. And he said, one way of looking at this might be that for 42 years, I've been making small, regular deposits in this bank of experience, education, and training. And on January 15th, 2009, the balance was sufficient so that I could make a very large withdrawal. <laughs> That's a good line. You might take your phones out and take a picture of that. <laughs> might be good. Uh, and I, I personally believe that we are all getting prepared for our five minutes uh, of really the unthinkable. And it's, it's not, you know, God doesn't get his jollies pulling the wings off people. But he does establish a script for us. If faith pleases him, like simple math. If faith pleases God, how much faith does he want us to have? A lot. Faith is the substance of things you're hoping for, the evidence of things not seen. That means you're not going to be seeing it. You're not going to be feeling it. You're not going to think you can do it. It's literally living in the apostle, impossible. As I get older, and I'm still conscious and passionately pursuing the Lord, the only thing on my plate is impossible. I don't even look at something if it's not impossible. That's really a waste of my time. I don't really have time for non-impossible things. And in the reality, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I, I mean it with all my heart. I, I feel like um, I'm fighting to not fall asleep, to not, not have spiritual lethargy come in me, and I just start walking in my sleep, talking in my sleep, just going through some little religious automaton thing that I have no interest in. And really drove me to atheism for seven years. When I saw religiousness without reality, I wanted nothing to do with it. But when I saw reality, I want it with all my heart. And I want to live fully conscious of what God has. And part of the ruination of my life was being saved in a revival. <laughs> where you see people getting saved. Where you see people, when they, when they have conviction, then all of a sudden they, they come to the Lord and they just fall on their knees at the altar. Does it happen here a lot? I hope it does. I hope it comes again. My whole desire for my future is to be in a little mosh pit, uh, hugging sweaty people who smell <laughs> like alcohol, like bad breath, like body odor, who have surrendered their life to Jesus. Yesterday, my wife and I were driving in Marysville, California, on our way back from a prayer retreat with about 14 intercessors. And we just got gas. And again, I came back from this wired, fired up to believe God for a move of his spirit. And uh, we got into an alley, literally behind the house that we lived in for three years, like 50 feet away from the house we lived in. And there was a guy on the side of the road in the alley trying to put a shoe on. And I could see just observing him that he was having trouble. Somehow he had one hand. He, and when I got out front, I said, so you stop the car. She's kind of used to it. It's awkward. But she, I stopped the car. I ran back and just said, what's going on? He goes, I, I got hit by a train. Now, again, you don't hear that every day. I hit by a train. And I could see he could not move this arm. So I had to take off some shoe, put some shoes on. Uh, he's, you know, wondering. I'm going to ask his name. Why do you want to know? I mean, it was a, it, all of a sudden, am I a cop? What am I? Why am I doing this? And then just loving on him and praying for him and looking at his eyes. And he says, I'm, I'm an alcoholic and I'm, I'm struggling. And, uh, and yet at one point he said, I am a Christian. I mean, here, here is this, uh, in the middle of this moment on this planet, guys, there's people on the sides of the road opportunities for us to love on people. And I want to be flexible enough to respond to the Spirit because I believe there's a way. Now, I couldn't do everything, but I could do something. I could not, you know, make him brand new all over again. But at least I could look at his eyes and say, I love you, and Jesus loves you, and he sees you, and, and he just stopped me to come. I gave him 20 bucks, and I, that's what I could do at that moment. But Jesus went about doing good and healing all of those who were oppressed by the devil. So that was my little five minutes. It probably was 10. But that was five minutes of opportunity to obey the Holy Spirit. And so some of them will be cataclysmic like this. 
Others will be more um, easily entreated. And, and so I'm going to give you, I'm going to say something you might not have thought of. Um, our life on this earth is the shortest season of our eternal life. It is the dress rehearsal for eternity. And so what is happening now, the muscles you build, the relationship with God you have. Did I get you? Good. Amen, Lord. Yes. This is a multimedia experience. Just keep it going. This is fun. I like this. Don't stop it. Disco rock. We used to have extreme rock. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I remember talking to a Christian not that long ago, a year or so ago, and he, he, was, he, he didn't understand that we would need faith in heaven or hope. He somehow thought, you know, that's for now, but I said, excuse me a second. So let's look in the Bible here. I hope it's the next slide. Maybe not. Just go to that. Just find it. Well, uh, yeah, it's 1 Corinthians 13, 13. The Bible says there are three things that last forever. Faith, hope, and love. You're going to need all the faith you can get forever. That means in eternity, you're going to be believing to see the things you don't see. You have greater stewardships ahead of you. So do I. And let's just go back to Matthew 25, 21. I'm verifying this by what Jesus said. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. You should be back a couple slides. Uh, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. We're going to get there. Is this the reverse? Do you guys have reverse? In the... Okay. So faithful over a little. The lights have gone out, and now the computer's gone. There it is. Okay. I will set you over much. So wait a second. Where's the little? Earth. Where's the much? Eternity. I mean, if you think we're going to be sitting around on silvery clouds with cherubs floating around with snack trays. <laughs> I mean, Really? I don't even want that at the entrance of heaven. <laughs> if I'm being prepared for greater stewardships, now that may be intimidating. You may be going, Power man, I'm just trying to get to this earth. You know, I, I understand. In the 70s, in the rapture mode, I thought I would go to heaven the next day. I even wrote a song called Rapture Practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm suited up. And counting down each new sunrise I got my ticket for a place on that rocket ride Cause the day he comes I'm blasting off and away we'll fly Sailing for that home beyond the sky And it's rapture practice The whole place oh, rapture practice Everybody out of your seats We're gonna dance for joy Well, I did that until about 1975 <laughs> And then I began to study eschatologically how it might end. And some nights I go to bed, I'm a pre-trib, I'm a mid-trib, I'm a post-trib, I'm a mid uh, And finally I became, I'm a pan-millennial. It's going to pan out at some point, and I don't know what <laughs> is going to happen. But all of a sudden I segued about 1975 to, you know, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to love God. I'm going to love people. I'm going to love God. I'm going to love people. But then as you get older and you see, you know, what it, when Ecclesiastes 3.11, that should be the next slide, he's planted eternity in the human heart. Now, what does that mean? Again, it's not singing in the sweet by and by. Yeah, we'll sing that a little bit. It's a beautiful shore. It's going to be awesome. The reunion was great today. Do we want to really go through each other's pictures at this point? I don't want to just do reminisce. I want to, you know, let's yeah. do some new stuff. Yeah. And now, unless you're struggling with transition and you're thinking, oh, can't we just have it normal? <laughs> you mean, can't you be God longer? <laughs> Can you decide what normal looks like longer? 
trust God. Enjoy the ride. I do like the expression. It's in Hezekiah. Just check it out in the Old Testament the book of Hezekiah. Don't give me good news. It only weakens me. It doesn't exist. But anyway, it's a good, it is a, it's a good comment. I like it. I like, I like the jolt of the Spirit of God saying, Francis, I'm here. I don't want him, in my mind's eye, I know it's not going to happen, but I don't want to stand before God. And he goes, you know, what the heck were you so concerned about? What more did I really need to do? Uh, I don't want to be that. I know it's not going to happen. I'm just saying. He's done enough. I need to remember. That's why I have to wash my mind with the water of the word every day because I am prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Pl prone to leave the God I love. I want to remember it, so I wash myself with the word of God. Now, as I've read about people, and again, at this point, when I read through the Bible every year, I'm looking for the old dudes and dudettes. I'm looking for the, how the old people landed their planes. That, that's my bullseye. And I would have thought um, some of them landed better than they actually did. And I would have thought some of them landed worse than they actually did. So you need to reread the Bible regularly because you're going to see new things. And so I have had misconceptions about people. Uh, I defaulted to maybe the, sh the, the inciting incident of their life, something that shocked me. And I thought that maybe is the way it played out. But in reality, upon a further examination, it wasn't. Let me just say this. When we are looking at our lives or other people's lives or even other people in history, I think of this first, Romans 14, 14. Um, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. He'll be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. And so one of the most important things in life is not to judge others. I remember years ago, I've not mentioned this to Susie in probably decades. Uh, we're living in Tahoe probably the early 80s, maybe mid-80s, and Jimmy, T Jim and Tammy Baker were on TV, and uh, when I would see them, uh, it would kind of grieve my heart. I don't know, I just didn't. So I put up in the kitchen their picture, and in giant letters, don't judge. <laughs> so I was just trying to not <laughs> just begin to judge people that I didn't understand. If you're from a different planet, nothing I can do, you're just... And then they did wind up obviously having some issues, but I'm still not, it's not my deal to judge. You could say you're having discernment. No, I was trying to keep from superimposing on someone else I wouldn't want someone to do to me. I don't, I don't think I'm the judge of anyone. They'll stand before the Lord and that's it. Revelation is 12. Now the accuser, the cancel culture that's happening right now has a founder. His name is Satan. Lucifer, he is the founder of the cancel culture. And so it says this in Revelations 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last. The accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to the earth. The one who accuses them before God day and night. The reality is, guys, when the Bible says we have not yet resisted unto blood, it's only a seasonal thing. The reality is those who live godly will be persecuted. And if you are aware of what's going on, it is coming to America in a great way. I wrote a book in 2009 called 2029 about the church of the future, which I talked about that there's going to be an apostate church that's going to have a uh, government approved Bible. Uh, even as you know, the Bible says another Jesus, another spirit, uh, you know, uh, another gospel. Uh, and so th there'll be brand X that will be positing what the uh, new acceptable religion is. Kind of like the, the self-church in China. There's a, a self-church you can visit there, but it's all government approved. And so the reality is, um, I want to be ready for deception coming my way. And I also realize that I alone will stand before God. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We will receive whatever we deserve for good or evil we have, that we have done in our earthly bodies. And again, it continues in uh, chapter 4, verse 5. Don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he'll make our darkest secrets light. My favorite comment there is he'll make our darkest secrets light. 
Just kidding. Okay, that's just really awesome. And reveal our private motives. But it's meant, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. It's a, good st- it's a good thing. It's foundational. It's what we need in our lives. But that sentence, that's, you know, our private motives. Then he will give to each one whatever praise is due. So in reality, what I think of you or what you think of me is pointless. It doesn't make a difference. The only thing that matters is between us and God. And the reality, when they killed Jesus thinking they were doing God a service, that people are going to improperly judge people and even kill them. And that has happened and is happening in history and will happen again. And it will probably wash up to our shores as well. So I believe, and I could be wrong, that it's going to be more challenging ahead. You may not. You may be going, man, things are just working out. It just seems like it's just coming together. Yeah. I, I take Jesus to the promises he's given me. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. I said, Lord, you promised to come on. <laughs> I'm holding you to it. That's right. But then he says, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So we're called to be overcomers. I, and if overcomers means that you're, something's coming at you and you're overcoming it. When we stand before God and said, you overcame, that means something was coming at you. Now, if you believe less is coming at you in the days ahead, that's really between you and God. I don't. I believe more. I'm getting ready. I'm, I'm getting stronger in the spirit as best I can so that I can face the greater challenges ahead. And so, um, even if as we listen to this message and consider our deal and our failures, I mean, this room is also filled not... This is also filled with serial sinners. These are people, these are people that were committed to sin. You gave yourself over to sin. You needed, you sinned so bad, you needed the God of the universe to take the bullet for you. Because you were in trouble. So even if we though are looking at our lives and feeling bad about who we are and what we've done, 1 John 3.20, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God's greater than our hearts and he knows everything. You know, I know there's nothing, then there's next to nothing. That's how much I know there's nothing, next to nothing. So I don't know everything. He does. I can't judge not even your heart. I can't judge my heart fully. I don't default to thinking I have a good motive, but nor do I default to thinking... Um, I really, I, lately I've been, you know, the last maybe year... I've been looking at confidence and pride. You know, the, the, w- w- what is the difference between confidence and pride? And trying to, because I didn't want to be, the right, righteous or as bold as a lion, and the lion turns aside for none. Well, that's good if you got that confidence, that boldness. But I don't want it to turn into self confidence. So I want to be an empty vessel. It's the simultaneous emptying of ourself. Now, how did John the Baptist do it? He said, he must increase that I may decrease. So it's not about you, you know, uh, self-effacing, doing things, flagellation of yourself. It's not you decreasing. It's letting him increase and you will naturally decrease. So I want Jesus to get bigger. And if he gets bigger, then I will organically get smaller. And that is a very good thing. Now, in landing the plane shortly, uh, the guy in the Bible that I thought, I felt sorry for. I felt bad for him. I said, man, Pummer, Moses, you know, he strikes the rock a couple times. I mean, I, I made the rock a Congo. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, he, two times, he strikes the rock two times. And then he can't go in the promised land. How high is this bar here? Moses, what chance do I have? And so that was faulty thinking. And that's in the book of Numbers. We can look at that in the book of Numbers, verse, chapter 20, verse 11. He raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the staff and water gushed out. So the entire community, the livestock drank their full. This is the kind of the beginning of their wilderness. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people, you will not lead them into the land I am giving them. And then I thought, man, 
that must have been very deflating. And, and yet, like David, after his child died, he washed himself and stopped fasting and said, he can't come to me, but I will go to him. It would be 40 years throughout the book of Deuteronomy that Moses would walk in the stewardship of guiding the, the children of Israel into the promised land, knowing he would not go in. Did he guide them with a giant chip on his shoulder, feeling sorry for himself? Yeah, but I don't get to go in. Is that, they think that was his attitude? Or did he immediately say, you know what? God, you're right. You're right. I don't, I don't get to go in. But you know what? I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. You have a stewardship for me. And so I'm going to put my hand in the plow and not look back. I'm going to go forward and I'm going to guide two million people into that land. So what I would say to all of us at this point, I don't need outcomes to be good. As a matter of fact, I'm not in charge of outcomes. It was said well by Aaron. I'm in charge of obedience. Obedience means God's on the throne. Outcomes, and I'm just getting my rear end a little bit on the throne. I'm thinking, I think I know what's happening here. I think I know how this is going to work out. And ultimately, <laughs> that, I promise to never do that again. That visual, <laughs> I've met, my wife has never seen that before. Have you seen me do that in a message? Never. In 47 years. And I felt defiled when I did it myself. <laughs> you will not be seeing that again. But I was making a point that I want to let outcomes are in his court. I'm just being obedient. What should happen? I have no idea. What will be best? Who knows? What are you hoping for? I'm hoping that God's in charge and I'm not. Don't try and seduce me. Don't try and make me you know, jump in the control room like I know what's going on. I have no idea what's going on. His, he saw, he said, you know what? My thoughts, not your thoughts. My ways, not your ways. So what do you think? No, I've never asked. He's never asked me what I think. <laughs> well, Francis, what do you think about what's going on? So what I get out of Moses is the guy finished really well. I'm not interested in things working out. What does that even mean? Does a cross look like things worked out? Does a fiery furnace look like things worked out? The lions in a den? You know, what does working out look like? To me, it looks like my last breath. I'm trusting Jesus. Now, I have some questions. I'm going to throw this in there. David, on his deathbed, went, Make sure Shimei has a bloody death. Hmm, I'm going, oh, hey, that's a little, oh my gosh. I'm not sure I want to call out a contract on my deathbed. Make sure. Shimei was a bad dude, and he mocked him as he left the land to go into exile because of Absalom. But Shimei then came back, and then one of his guys wanted to kill him right then. He said, no, don't do that, because maybe what he said would help me. Maybe it was true, and so maybe I needed that. But on his deathbed, you know. <laughs> okay, so I, again, I'm not, I, but the, that's why I don't judge, because I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Solomon, I love him. Mmm. Mmm. Solomon. I have had the most trouble with Solomon this past year. I literally have felt like if I would, I'd gotten to heaven and he's there, They'll be happy. Stop it. Solomon, I'm going to punch your lights out. That's how I felt. I've tried to modify that, but I still feel that way. The smartest guy who ever lived jumped out of a plane without a backpack. The smartest guy who ever lived worshipped demons, Chemosh, Molech at the end of his life. And these things are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world has come. And it scares me. Some people, you know... I am, you know, they bless the heck out of me. Others scare the hell out of me. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. I don't know if I'll see Solomon in heaven. Let me ask you, can you worship demons? At, this is the final verses. Only God knows, only God knows, only God knows. But then go to heaven? Uh, he thought so. 
I mean, I don't want to end that way. So what I'm saying, all of this is meant to say, transitions in life come. He's in charge. It's going to be great. He wants to look in our eyes and say, I got this. Trust me. So there's fluidity happening that are micro moments that may last a short season, but then there are the macro in eternity. And I'm preparing my heart to respond well as best I can for every handoff, every transition. And I count them as a blessing. You know, ordained an evangelist, spent a few years doing that. Then I was asked to pastor for a season. And I remember my, my father in the Lord, the revival's ending. I got saved in a revival. It's now the dregs of the revival. No one's coming through, you know. And I'm asked, the community that once had a powerful move of God now is filled with people that are, are questionable in terms of their interest in God. So they, they need, they're sleeping with each other. They're starting to do drugs again. Uh, the whole thing is turning into Babel. And so he asked me to go back for six to nine months. And I said, that's like asking Evil Knievel to go teach Sunday school kids how to roller skate. So I, I didn't want to be squatting among the sheep and scratching their wool. Uh, I didn't want to be doing something that I was not excited about. But I did it. I said, okay, I'll do it. And I thought it would be for four, six to nine months. It was four years and four months to the day. 52 months to the day. And even though I couldn't wait to get out of that season... It was a complete season, and we did it, and it was a good season. Then I traveled 18 years, then pastored 21 years. And again, great season. I loved all those seasons, but they ended. And um, now Susie and I are opening up a hip-hop shop shortly, and it's going to be, <laughs> whoo, it's just going to be awesome. You've not seen Susie dance? You thought I was good. No, okay. Um, so I want you to, today, we are going to do some things, and we are going to uh, pray over your amazing leaders, uh, because transition is in the air. Uh, a little handoff is taking place that is exciting, because I do believe uh, both the person handing off and the person receiving the handoff are divinely chosen by God and have done extremely well in navigating Sometimes uh, the transitions take a while before they're fully formed. But as I've seen, in a sense, the plain land, I realize he does all things well. God knows exactly what he's doing and that our future is bright if we'll trust him. And so I believe all parties involved have a bright future. Everyone coming to this stage in a moment has an incredibly bright future. And the only person who knows that is God but he's doing a great job in their lives and they have done a great job responding to the twists and turns of life. The things that you don't fully understand, but you feel them anyway with a good attitude and trust. And because of that, the presence of God showed up here. Because of that, it makes the handoffs sweet. And over time you understand more. You know, I didn't know what my next was when I crowd surfed out of here. I didn't know what my next was. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know. But I didn't have to know. And, and I don't have to know right now, you know. I've only got 40 more good years. And I don't have to know where that's headed. I'm just going to trust him. So I want you to invite, and these are great men, um, and I love and respect and honor them very much. Would you welcome Pastor Brandon, Pastor Sean, and Pastor Bob up, please. And Josh, and Josh. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to keep hang on. Hi, Josh. All right, I'm going to talk first to Brandon. And you may be seated. Thank you. Brandon, I was Captain Brandon Sullenberger. Brandon Sullenberger, you, my friend. I love you and respect you and honor you. I've known you since you were 17, which is a few years. And just to watch you in this season where unthinkable things, things that none of us sign up for, things you go, how could that happen? How would God allow it to happen? Whatever happened. And then I watch you feel them. Yeah, it knocked the wind out of you. It smacked you silly. But you responded well. And I am very proud of you. And I've seen you respond really as Jesus would. And again, in, in the ambiguity of that season, 
you stayed. I love I love the comment about Captain Sullenberger. It says that he went back twice and checked for every passenger. I remember just crying when I read that. He went mm-hmm. back twice. There's something about finishing well as a hard attitude, meaning I don't want to leave anyone behind. Anyone that I could help, anyone that has any ambiguity, any misunderstanding, I want them to know I'm okay. My life is good. My future's bright. I believe with all my heart, you're coming into an extraordinarily great season. I believe it's going to be better than any season you've had before. I'm not allowed to lie. My boss does not let me lie. And I believe that with all my heart, this response, every season is good. I mean, yeah, evangelism was good. I've been prophetic. I've been intercessed. They're all good seasons. But my identity is not in them. My identity is in him. And so your identity in him is solid. For a season, you were, have been a great pastor here. Great pastor. Come on. Great pastor. Great pastor. And they, we have watched your engines go powerless at some point when the unexpected happened and smashed you. And you stayed in the cockpit. You landed the plane. And as, as 155 souls were lining on that plane, you can put that picture up there again, as they lined that plane, and they had a 10-year reunion in 2019, just thanking him. You did the same thing, buddy. You landed the plane, still sorting out. I don't know what's going on fully, but I'm going to stick to this position till I get my next assignment. And I believe you're now moving your next assignment. But I am, as your father, as your friend, father in the Lord, friend, someone who loves you dearly, I am very proud of you. I'm honored to know you. Amen. Get my bearings here. Thank you, buddy. Uh, I arrived on the doorstep of the Rock of Roseville in the winter of 1999. I was greeted by what they call the gauntlet of love. Many outside hugging you, shaking your hand. You didn't know what you were going to do if it was a church or a cult meeting. You did not know. As I went up those stairs, I met a highly energetic individual that shook my hand, and I looked him in the eye, and he said, you looked me in the eye. I said, yeah, my name's Brandon. He said, leaders look people in the eye. He slapped me on the shoulder. I went and sat down uh, with my family, and that same energetic individual that I thought was the greeter captain was Pastor Francis. I thought to myself, I've never met a man like that. We all know we walk into God's plans with our own plans. We expect those plans to come to come to pass, but God has different plans in mind. My senior year in high school, I had plans to go into business, go to college, work with my father in real estate investment. But God had different plans. And they talked about this internship that I had to join. So I said, okay, God, I'll give you one year. I'll give you one year. Well, that one year turned into 20. And from that, I had plans to go back into business school, and I told them one year of commitment. But the church was going through radical change. And we were a church that was going to plant churches. So me and my friends, we went to a back room, drew straws on who would be the youth pastor of which church. Rock of Granite Bay, Rock of Rockland, the Rock of Roseville. They all drew first, and I drew the short stick, which was the Rock of Roseville. Clayton Butler was there. But as we were there and we prayed, I knew I had an assignment here that I thought would be short. But God continued to extend it. In those first few years, we saw miracles that you could not explain. As he mentioned, an extreme church, etc. We saw entire groups of hippies come to know the Lord and plant churches. Brian Burkett, one of those. We saw, again, I never talk about these miracles from the stage, but guess what? It's my last day, so I will. We saw the glory of the Lord come in the manifestation of a gold dust cloud and fill the entire auditorium and the stage at one service. 
We saw creative miracles where people's legs would grow out. We saw things that we could not explain, and we expected that to be normal. As we continued on, we built this building, and we saw the seasons change. And as I had plans to go out into business, we lost many real estate investment homes, and the Lord said, there is no plan B, only me. So I said, Lord, I'll go all in, whatever you need. As season of hardship happened here, and Francis could identify, we didn't know what was going to happen with the future of the church. And in 2009, I was given a very uh, exciting job opportunity to go to a very prominent church. But the Lord said, no, it's called to stay. All my friends said, bad decision. But God's decisions are the best decisions. So I stayed, and we saw an unprecedented revival in 2010 happen for four years with our students. We saw this city set on fire for Jesus. We saw this entire auditorium filled with those that were crying out for the Lord. We saw the lost get saved. And that ruined me for what ministry is. We knew that we needed to see Acts 2 come alive. And we studied and gave our lives for it. And people like Aaron and Dylan and others, many that are here. I won't say names because I'll leave someone out. Julia, I saw Julia there. <laughs> we knew that we were made for something different. But in 2014, after one of our students contracted a very rare uh, organ infection, he was on death's door. And we made a commitment to fast and pray for his life. And every day there was a student at his door of his hospital believing for him to come back to life. And God did and completely healed this young man. It's an amazing story. But at that time, I was exhausted. I was a young dad. And, and I, was, I, I was at my end. And I was on a run. And I read, I, I quoted those verses. You know when you quote verses to Jesus like he doesn't know what they are? I quoted that I had run the race. <laughs> I would fought the good fight. And I was done. And on this run, I've told the story before. I'm standing on this grass field and I hear what I thought was the audible voice of the Lord saying, keep going, Brandon. But it turned out to be a coach yelling at a kid on the track team that was too slow and his name was Brandon. <laughs> I got the hint. And sure enough, when I said, yes, Lord, and I know my season's not done here then. A few days later, Francis and Bob pulled me aside and said, we're planning to transition. Would you be willing to take on the senior role at the Rock of Roseville? In which I quoted back to them a vision the Lord gave me. He said, he's my anchor and my sail. And in this season, you're anchored. I was called to be here. We then went through a very long transition process that was not for the faint of heart. We saw families get discipled. We saw outreach get established. God brought mentors in my life like Mike Breen, and we wanted to create a discipling culture at this church, which we did by God's grace. And upon that transition in 2018, we knew we had to make radical changes. As God had revealed that the future church needed to change, the future church would be house churches, and you could not be debt laden in order to fulfill his vision. We had to do the impossible, which all my mentors said, never make a radical change in the first year. Especially don't sell your building. But God had a different way. Through a long circumstance, we were able to transition this building with Acton School, and God began to lower that debt. We knew that needed to happen. If it did not happen in that window of 2019, we would not have made it another three months when 2020 hit. There's no way. We were told we would be insolvent in three months, but God showed up and provided. From that, we then went into the hardest season of my life. And I had a train wreck, a plane crash that I did not anticipate. As a single father now, I was standing in that coffee shop with Francis after family leave. Where's my music? <laughs> Come on, dude. <laughs> Howard, you know me. We've done this together a long time. <laughs> I love you, buddy. Got all serious. Um, Francis took me in he said hey no one will fault you if you step down no one, no one does this no one continues after going through what you have but I, I said and I knew this with conviction my assignment wasn't over and we went through that and we knew we had to get out of debt and God took us through an incredibly hard season it was difficult there it is I'm going to keep it together here. I could go off. 
But we went through and God's miraculous provision in a dream that he gave me in 2007 that I shared with Francis came to pass in December of last year. We were able to get out of debt as a church. And God showed up in a significant way. But in January, after this announcing the Lord's miraculous provision of paying off the Bonita building, I began to pray and ask the Lord for his next assignment on my life in the rock. I began to reflect on the past four years and all the difficulties that my family had endured and overcome. These challenges have taken a significant toll on me physically and emotionally. The complexity of leading the church while also being a single dad of four children led me to seek the counsel of mentors and spiritual advisors on if my season of pastoring would be coming to an end. I began to share with the elders about my concern for my health and my family, and they have been aware of significant challenges and struggles I've gone through these last four years and the toll that it's taken. A little over two weeks ago, while at an elders meeting, they shared with me their heart and their desire for me and my family to thrive in this next season. After prayer and seeking counsel from outside advisors, they believe it's time for me to step down from a position as lead pastor of the Rock Roseville. Although this was not the time I anticipated, I do trust their leadership and their wisdom. They are for me and for the Rock. As Pastor Bob has shared with me many times, a fighter does not always know when their time in the ring is finished. You have to rely on your coaches and teammates to tell you when it's time to recover. As friends and mentors have asked me, has the Lord released you from your position? And after much prayer and fasting, I believe the Lord has released me from my current assignment as lead pastor from the church. I will forever be grateful for this community and the leaders and friends and family that have stood by my side in the midst of tremendous challenge. I have full confidence and trust in the character of Pastor Sean and Josh. I absolutely do and their ability to navigate this next season for the Rock of Roseville. This past week, I received a scripture from a trusted friend that I believe best summarizes my heart for our church as my time here has come to an end. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge... will award me on that day, not only to me, but also for those that have longed for his appearing. In my final verses, I would exhort you, church, in this, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given you, Rock of Roseville, a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say with itching ears what they want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of the evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Your allegiance is not to a man or a pastor. It is to Jesus only. As much as I love... Those that say, they're for me. I know you're for me, but be for him, way before me. That's all that matters in all of this. My heart is to be a part of his church. As we've said many times, he does not see denominations. He does not see Bayside, The Rock, Jesus Cultures. He sees the church of Roseville. That's all he sees. And that's the church we're all a part of. I love this church. We'll forever be grateful for this church. And on my day of transition, or when I took over in 2018, a longtime staff member came to me and said, I have something to give you. And he handed me this. This is the master key of this building. First key that was ever made. And he said, I took it from Francis because I didn't want him to lose it. <laughs> so I kept this key as a symbol. And this day, I hand this key to you, Sean. It's the master key. Faithful steward. So I met Brandon, I'll try to keep this brief. I met Brandon 
uh, at Bible College, Trinity Life Bible College, Trinity Life. Um, and I was so impressed with him the first time I met him because I was engaged to be married and, and you were single back then. And I just asked him, you know, I'd, I'd met him in a class or between class and I said, hey, do you have a lady? And he was like, no. <laughs> like so confident. I just wasn't used to that, the culture I grew up in. He was like, no, man, I, I court. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, and just watching him minister in chapel, um, literally playing the guitar until his fingers were bleeding because Paul Gottlieb decided he wanted to just go on and on and on. And I just knew that this was a, this was a really, really, really dope dude. Um, and, uh, and so Amy and I, we transitioned out of our church about seven years ago. And we were, we were thinking about where we, would, where we would go next. And we didn't want to go into the summer really worried about all that. And so we said, you know, we'll just camp at a few churches and we'll figure this out in the fall. And so <clears throat> we knew that my best friend, Brandon Leon, went here. And if you guys know Brandon, he is such a recruiter of people. <clears throat> that I didn't want to come here when he was here. <clears throat> so I said, Amy, they have a nine o'clock service and I know Brandon and Vanessa won't be there. <laughs> and so, and so we, walk, we walk up to the door and we meet a greeter and this greeter literally grabs my arm, looks me in the eye and we just have this really, really cool connection and I just remember going and taking our kids to childcare and saying, Amy, man, their door greeters are anointed. It's like, it's like, man, that dude was really cool, really cool. Come in, sit down. And that greeter steps up on the stage and he says, hi, everyone. My name is Pastor Francis. <laughs> so I had the same story. Uh, and then later that same service, I see Brandon walk on stage and I'm just sitting in that corner over there and I'm like, that's Brandon. And so we see each other after service and we chat and it was like, we never, like no time had passed. And I, I just want to say this to you guys that, um, you know, there, there were a lot of, like Amy and I, we came here to heal. We, we, we needed time to heal when we came here. And I made Brandon very aware of that early. And uh, he walked us through so much. I mean, there was a moment, and I don't know how much you remember this, but uh, when I started to, to communicate here, that I was in my car and I was supposed to communicate that Sunday, I think it was like Tuesday, I said, Brandon, called him on the phone and said, I'm quitting. I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I, I think I'm just going to love my family, raise my family. I think I'm done with ministry. And he so graciously talked me out of it. <laughs> uh, you know, and I mean, gosh, he had, sent me to multiple like preaching schools, all this stuff. I mean, he has invested in me so much. And so, Brandon, I, I said yes to this because I know I was called to it. But I will never forget what you did to bring me here. And so I love you. I really do. I love you so much. So give him a hand one more time. We love him. You may be seated again. You will be standing shortly, but I just wanted to say, too, that in this whole process, you know, we look into the unknown, just like Captain Sully, and you have to respond well at that moment because you might not have a next moment. You may bolt, you may make poor decisions, and all of a sudden, you know, you miss an opportunity. And you guys, really, in navigating um, something that was gradual revealing, that I believe in a year from now, we'll all look back and go, it was the right time and God helped us through it. And you guys, amongst many others as well, are the right people to take the baton. None of us feel fully adequate for anything. Adequate is not necessary. But we are going to uh, pray over you, Bob. I think you got something you wanted to say? No, I'm gonna pray. 
Okay, so why don't we um, ask Sean to come and Brandon, and um, in particular, we want to bless this man. Josh, come as well, but we want to bless this man and send him forth into his magnificent next. And so, Bob, you can start us off. I do want to... I'm new at this. Um, (laughs) Before we pray, I just want to say thank you for being such a good steward of my transition a year and two months ago. And uh, a lot of pastors uh, don't do it well, and you did it exceptionally. And uh, I I am having the time of my life (laughs) right now. I kid you not. No more meetings. It's awesome. I get to go to the world. I get to hang out with some really poor people around the world. And thank you for doing that. For me and so you reap what you sow and you're gonna have a great transition here and uh, before we pray I just want to say this morning when I was just praying and meditating about this uh, you are gonna go through immense gratitude in the next three months followed by a great anticipation that I think it is gonna just uh, intersect at Thanksgiving so father I thank you for pastor Brandon I thank you for his life I thank you for his leadership his stewardship God of this church, my life, my transition. And I thank you that we pray to you, the God of right now. We're not worried about tomorrow. We're not worried about yesterday. We're engaged in right now, the God of right now. And today we hear your voice, God. And you're the God of the next. And I thank you, God, that the end of a thing is better than the beginning. Because it's at the end of a thing that you do a new thing. And I thank you for the new thing you're going to do and are doing in Pastor Brandon's heart, his mind, his will, his emotions, his family, and his future. And I thank you that he is moving from glory to glory, faith to faith. I thank you, God, he is experiencing a new weightiness in you and of you. And God, we pray to you, the God of all transitions, from Genesis to Revelation, you've never failed one time at anybody's transition. And so we bless this time, we bless this moment, we bless the Rock of Roseville, we bless Pastor Brandon and his family right now. Your kingdom come, your will be done in him and through him, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. We thank you for this dear man who has showed us what courage looks like, Lord. I think of that man who jumped into a pit with a lion on a snowy day. And so he was willing to jump into a situation that he found himself in and stay there as long as necessary. Thank you for how he guided his family, his children, his church family, Lord, and helped this moment to occur with your presence and peace in this house, Lord. Thank you for the leaders who are here. Thank you for his dad and mom as well, and for the other uh, friends and co-leaders, joint heirs with him. We speak blessing over him and his life and his future. We pray that his best days are ahead. We pray that you are script with him with him would become flesh and that he would know this is the way walk in it and that out of that would come divine favor and blessing and help and health on every level we pray you'd provide for his needs spirit soul body finances relationship every dimension lord meet this man's need and let him know lord as he looks back let him look back with peace and confidence that you did allow him to land the plane on that incredible day in those five minutes uh, where it was scary where he felt powerless at times but uh, all souls came out safe and we thank you for that Lord in Jesus name Amen Okay. All right. Are you Sean, um, why don't you get, can you give him the mic? Is that all right? And Sean, you're done, baby.
Let's stand together. Um, Y'all think we stay in here all day? Just stretch your hands out towards the stage. Lord, we thank you that you are sovereign, that you are God. I was reminded of a, a quote that the, uh, the widow of Jim Elliot, the, the precious uh, missionary, Elizabeth Elliot said, God is God. And if he is God, then there's no place safer than in his will. Hmm. In his will, in his will, it is immeasurably, unspeakably, and infinitely, infinitely greater than our largest notions of what he's up to. And so God, we just thank you that though transitions are uncomfortable, though these are moments where um, everyone's trying to figure out their next, we thank you, God, that we can trust you. Lord, I thank you for the friendship with Brandon that will never end. I thank you for my brother. I thank you for the life giving spirit he has been to me and my family and to all of us. And so God, I pray that as he, as he moves on, uh, that your grace and your mercy will continue to follow him everywhere he goes. Lord, we thank you for this, this beautiful church. We thank you for the precious saints and families that are represented here. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you that this place is perfectly positioned for its next because of the stewardship of Brandon. And so we ask God that you would fall on us and that as we begin to think about and pray about what the next is, God, that it would be completely led by you. And so we are open-handed. We want to hear your voice. We want to follow you, God. We want to do everything that's in your heart to do in the city of Roseville, at the gates of this city, Lord God. Show us what the next is here at the Rock. And we'll be very careful to obey. And as a congregation, everyone said, Amen, 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 amen. So yeah, we have something for Brandon that we want to bring up. Yeah. Amen. Um, I believe... Okay, so there's also a basket outside if you want to, to bless Brandon. Um, we would, we would ask that you do that. There should be a basket out there for you to be able to do that as well. Um, and so how, how do you, how do we end this? Should I tap dance? God bless you. Thank you guys. You got this. It's September 4th. You got to find four people right now. Tell them that Jesus loves them as you greet on your way out. God bless you. Thank you guys for coming.